Good day, brothers and sisters. It is Sunday once again. You know, one of the great promises that we have as believers in Christ, most especially as we fulfill the Great Commission, is that the Lord will always be with us until the end of age. And I think that particular promise that God has given to us is something that should bring comfort and confidence in our hearts. Because we know that our God is before us, He is behind us. He will lead us into the pathways and into the doors that He Himself will open. And therefore, we can walk about in this life fulfilling His ministry with boldness and courage. Now, when we go to the example of ancient Israel, ancient Israel lost a great leader in Moses. And oftentimes you would probably think, if Moses is gone, then what is going to happen to the nation of Israel? But friends, God is a God who knows things ahead of time, and He is a God who plans things ahead of time. And that is why in the same manner that we have courage because of the presence of the Lord, Joshua, who replaced Moses, had the courage and the boldness, most especially after God made this promise to him in Joshua chapter 1. And I'd like to read. It says, No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession uh, of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. So there you have it, dear friends, the Lord's presence being Joshua's assurance that whatever God had promised for the nation of Israel, it shall be fulfilled. God has displayed all throughout the Old Testament in the New Testament that He is Emmanuel, God with us. There is no other God who is like our God, even the false gods, cannot make this promise because they are not true. But our God has tabernacled with us. And that being the case, we should worship Him with all of our hearts. I will give thanks to you, my God. I will exalt your holy name forever. And ever, every day I will bless you and extol your glorious name forever and ever. I will give thanks to you, my God. I will exalt your holy name forever.
pag-ibig mo Walang katulad Inalay mo Buong buhay mo Para sa kaligtasan ko Wala nang ibang hihigit pa sa'yo Wala nang ibang katulad mo Ikaw lang ang Diyos Ikaw lang ang Diyos ang
Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph, and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Great news everyone, we already have three weekend services. Every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sabana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. The title of today's sermon is The Broadway Boys Deep Down. We'll take our text from Matthew 22, verses 15 to 22. Let's read. Then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth, and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their malice and said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God, the things that are God's. And hearing this, they were amazed, and leaving him, they went away. Let's bow our heads in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you, O God, for this blessed Sunday. And we pray, Father, that you might once again be with us. Be with me, Lord, that I might become a conduit of blessing to your people. I pray, Father, that I might communicate your truth and that I might be able to minister even to the deepest needs of your people, O God. Allow me to speak by the power and the wisdom of the Spirit as we ask, Lord, that you might glorify your name in our midst. Lord, we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Allow me to begin by sharing a little story. There was a professing Christian who tried to explain away his responsibility for breaking the law, and then he received double punishment. Well, this is what happened. He said to the judge, Your Honor, as a believer in Christ, I am a new man, but I still have an old nature. And it was that old man that committed the crime. The judge's reply to his plea was, since it was the old man that broke the law, well, we'll sentence the old man to 30 days in jail. And since the new man happens to be an accomplice in the wrong, we'll give him also another 30 days. I therefore sentence you to jail 
for 60 days. Now again, we find a professing Christian who is a hypocrite. And to be honest, there are many, many nominal professing Christians who are guilty of the sin of hypocrisy. Now, quite interestingly, the Greek word that is often used for the word hypocrite is the more uh, literal translation, which means play actor. Indeed, that is what the Pharisees were, pretending something that they were not. And in this passage, Jesus unravels them for what they really are. And Jesus proves himself as being of the truth. There are three things that we will be able to see in this narrative. First, in verses 15 to 17, the bait. Verses 18 to 21, the backfire. And in verse 22, the back out. And so let's unpack our study today and let's talk about the bait, first of all, in verses 15 to 17. It goes, Then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. Now, if there was something that would describe the Pharisees, they were consistent. They were consistently hardened in their heart, consistently opposed to the truth, consistently opposed to Jesus Christ, and consistently in pursuit of Jesus' destruction. And here, what you and I will see is that they pretend to be for Christ, when in truth, they were against him. What a great hypocrisy you and I see here. And again, one of the things that turns off a lot of people from becoming part of a church, and we're talking about a genuine Christian church, is the fact that there are nominal professing Christians. And oftentimes, we find them to be quite passionate and zealous and very open about their faith. But then again, when you examine their lives, you just see hypocrisy. What you see is an external facade of spirituality and maturity. But when you dig deeper into their lives, you will discover so many things. You will discover failed marriages. You will discover hypocrisy even in the home. And this is something that sometimes even the children themselves are able to recognize and point out. And this is the reason why it has become quite difficult to be able to share the gospel to some seeking souls. I recall the story of Mahatma Gandhi, and there was one particular time in his life wherein he wanted to somehow try out the Christian faith. And so he went to a particular church, and as he approached that church, he saw an usher uh, right at the door of the church building. But then even as a handshake was offered to him, according to his description, it was a very cold handshake. Well, guess what happened? Mahatma Gandhi did not enter that church. And this is what he said. He said, I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians. Friends, let us be very careful because we can be the very impediment and obstacle why people do not come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. For many centuries, genuine pearls commanded a very high price because of their scarcity. Great quantities of oysters had to be examined before a few could be found that contained the coveted treasures. Then suddenly, the market became flooded. And after some investigation, the mystery of the abundant supply was revealed. Enterprising individuals had discovered that if a foreign object is lodged in its tender flesh, the oyster will form a glistening, pearly uh, look around the source of discomfort. And so, deciding to help nature along, these men, artificially induced the process by inserting irritants such as tiny beads and, and box shots and, and the shells. 
And that's what they did. They put it into the shells. When the pearl is, is formed, they were carefully harvested. But this is what happened. Wealthy patrons became suspicious because they could not understand how the market had been flooded with an abundance of these things. And so they insisted that the lustrous jewels be subjected to special tests. Though outwardly they seemed perfect, the x-ray showed their impurity, for they had, quote-unquote, false hearts of lead or glass. And sometimes isn't that true with a lot of people? The Pharisees, in, in fact, according to the Lord Jesus Christ, were whitewashed tombs. But deep down inside, they were dead men's bones. And Jesus was actually talking about something that he had personally seen in Jewish culture and in Jewish custom. Because oftentimes, what would happen with some of the relatives when they would try to bring honor to someone who had passed away, they would, they would paint the outer portion uh, and they would whitewash it. So from the outward, it looks all right. But again, we know that inside this particular place would be dead men's bones. Now, in this particular case, what we find is that these Pharisees wanted to trap Jesus Christ. Talking about ancient frame-ups, this is definitely one of them. And so let's read verse 16. It says, And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth, and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any. Now here is flattery at its worst. They were saying things that about Jesus Christ that they did not really believe in. And so here's a very powerful lesson. Don't believe every form of flattery because it might just be a setup. Not everybody who says nice things to you can be trusted. In fact, the one who flatters you might really hate your guts. And you know, friends, in 40 years of ministry, I have met all kinds of people. And I've met people who would praise you and who would say such wonderful things about you, they would flatter you to the moon. But then again, you discover that they end up really backbiting you or saying some bad things. They might be smiling right in front of you and saying a lot of good things. But when you turn your back, it's another story. And this is exactly what we find in the Pharisees. That is why I call this sermon, I call the Pharisees Broadway uh, boys. Because what we find here is plain acting. It was not genuine. What they were saying was not really sincere. But they were flattering the Lord Jesus Christ in the hope that they could trap the Lord Jesus. And that is why be very, very careful about people who engage in too much flattery because you never know. You never know what they really have deep down inside. They might have an agenda and that agenda could even be to destroy you and your reputation. And the Bible is very clear on so many points because it warns us from people who do flattery. It says in Psalm 29 verse 5, a man who flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his steps. So, uh, Proverbs 26 uh, verse 28 says, a lying tongue hates those it crushes and a flattering mouth works ruin. So notice here the motivation in one verse is a net, a trap. In the other, it is to ruin a person. And that is why, again, be very careful. People who flatter you, people who only say good things about you, who praise you to the highest heavens, be very careful with these people. Why? 
because you'll never know they might have something at the back of their minds. And here in these passages that we have studied, we find that people oftentimes use flattery to be able to trap other people into something. And this is exactly what you and I see with these Pharisees. They were out there to ruin the Lord Jesus Christ. They were out there to set up traps. In other words, they did not have the good nor the welfare of Jesus in mind. All they had in their minds and hearts was to catch Jesus in a statement, to catch Jesus in something that will offend either the Roman Empire or the Jewish populace. And again, what they wanted to do was to destroy the reputation of the Lord Jesus Christ so that he would no longer have any influence nor any impact in the lives of other people. Nevertheless, even as they flattered the Lord Jesus Christ, even as they said certain things with a different motivation, let me just say this, although they were flattering Christ, what they said was in fact, true of the Lord Jesus. Only that, they did not mean it. Only that, they did not believe it. But all the things that they said were actually true of Jesus. First up, we know that Jesus happens to be truthful. And we know that from John 14, verse 6, wherein He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so we know that Jesus only speaks the truth. He does not lie. And that is why, again, we find here that although the Pharisees had different intentions, and although what they said they did not really mean, they were saying something which objectively is the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, we find another truth that they said that he was a teacher of the way of God. Now again, this is very clear in John chapter 14, verse 6, because indeed the Lord Jesus Christ presented perfect, accurate teaching regarding the path towards redemption and salvation. He presented facts and truths about God, which were 100% accurate. And he was able to discern man to his core. And everything that Jesus said was not only the truth, but he likewise told the people what the way of God was. Now also, we know that Jesus did not defer to anyone because he was impartial. Jesus was a fearless teacher. And you and I know that the Lord Jesus Christ never mints words. He was not afraid of anyone. He spoke the truth, and he spoke the truth in love. But friends, he would not mince words. He would not candy coat what he is trying to say. He spoke the truth in a very straightforward manner. Now, in verse 17, we find the question of the Pharisees. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? And so here we find what I'd like to call the trap question. The burning issue in the minds of many Jews of that day was simply this. If God owns Palestine, then they should not pay to any other power, any other king or any other God or any other person. Although they obviously did not fight against Romans or Rome's imposition of taxes, at least in their minds, a true-blooded Jew will find it abhorrent, and at least in theory, he will say that it is not right to pay taxes to Rome. And so again, we find this was a trick question. This was a trap question. Because what they wanted to do was to destroy the reputation of the Lord Jesus Christ, either to the Jewish people or to the Romans. Whatever the case might be, they just wanted to trap him and get rid of him. 
And again, that is pure hypocrisy. There are some people who pretend that they're after our own welfare, after our own good. And when they approach us, they approach us uh, and, you know, they approach us with, with a seeming heart that desires to help us. But in truth, the heart is deceitful. In truth, they don't really want to help. In truth, what they want to do was to destroy or is to destroy. Allow me to share a little historical background. It was the imposition of direct Roman taxation that had sparked off the revolt of Judas of Galilee in AD 6. And Judas' ideology was the mainspring for many of the resistance, which we label collectively as the Zealots. To approve of Roman taxation was to come out openly against this militant nationalism which enjoyed strong popular support. So hear me out. If Jesus said it's right to pay taxes to the Roman Empire, then he would incur the anger, most especially of the zealots. He would incur the anger of the people who thought it totally unpatriotic for one to pay the taxes. Of course, many of them were forced to do that and they had no choice. But then again, at least in principle or at least in, in their own perspective, their own opinion, they should be able to voice that out. But again, this was a trap. But you see, the trap backfired and we see that in verses 18 to 21. It says, But Jesus perceived their malice and said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Jesus, ever perceptive, knew that this was a malicious attempt to implicate him. Again, the Pharisees expose their true colors. You know, one of the things that I have observed, again, in terms of my 40 years of ministry or so, is that if you give a person time, the true colors will come out. And that is why in the selection of elders, in the selection of deacons, we are told in Scripture that we are to be very careful and we are not to be very hasty in putting a person in a position. And why do you think that is so? Because when we meet a person, obviously, a person will always put his best foot forward. But then the question is, how is this person when he faces crisis? How does this person respond when he goes through difficult times, through storms, when he meets an annoying person, or he becomes a victim of injustice, or he gets a lot of blessings. You know, things like this would ultimately reveal who a person really is. Just, just that, that is why just give a person some time and he will reveal his true colors. And this is what we discover with the Pharisees. They actually revealed their true colors over time. And that is why, again, friends, be very careful. Watch a person's track record. Observe a person first of all. Give that person time. Observe him in the midst of crisis and difficulty. Now, at this moment, I'd just like to share to you uh, a little illustration. Finding himself desperately in need of money, there was a man who went to the city zoo, hoping to get a job feeding the animals. Although no such opportunity was available, the manager, seeing the size and the strength of the applicant, suddenly got an idea. He said, you know, there are a few creatures who attract attention like a gorilla. Unfortunately, the gorilla we had died yesterday. If we got you a special fursuit, would you be willing to imitate the gorilla for a few days? And the hungry man agreed to try. 
he was quite successful as he beat his chest, he bellowed and shook the bars of his cage, much to the amusement of visitors who said they had never seen a gorilla with such intelligence. One day while swinging on his trapeze, he accidentally lost his grip and you know what happened? He fell into the lion's den. And so the huge beast gave a ferocious roar and backing away, the imposter gorilla realized he could not cry for assistance without revealing that he was a fake. So he retreated, hoping to crawl back over the fence into his own cage. The lion, however, followed him. Finally, in desperation, the man who was pretending to be gorilla yelled, Help! And immediately, the lion said in an undertone, Shut up, stupid! You'll get us both fired! So both the lion and the gorilla were fakes. Well, friends, that is what hypocrites are. They put on a mask. They put on a disguise. But deep down inside, they are fakes. Now, mind you, if the Lord Jesus answered no, then he would be reported as a traitor to the Roman government. Notice the duplicity in this particular question. Now, to make sure that they are witnesses to this, Guess what the Pharisees did? They brought together with them the Herodians. Now, what's the significance of the Herodians? Well, the Herodians were known to be pro-Rome. So they could be witnesses against the Lord Jesus Christ. Amazingly, here's, here's what is true during the first century. Traditionally, the Pharisees hated the Herodians. But notice here, because of a common cause, they now became bedfellows. The Herod family we know was not Jewish, but Edomian, descendants of Israel's ancient enemies, the Edomites. Beginning with Herod the Great, they had received favors from Rome in the form of various high political appointments, including rulerships over parts of Palestine. And that is why, again, that's the reason why they brought in the Herodians. Now, if Jesus, however, said yes, then he would be considered a traitor to Judaism, the Old Testament religion of the Jews. In other words, this was a case of damned if you do and damned if you don't. This was a no-win situation for Jesus with whatever answer he came up with. If he answered no, he would be considered a traitor to the Roman government. If he answered yes, he would be a traitor to the religion of the Jews. So what we see here with the Herodians bringing in or being brought in by the Pharisees, the Pharisees showed themselves to be the perfect balimbings of that time. Theirs was a philosophy of convenience. And such people are spiritual prostitutes, I would say, who sell themselves to the highest bidder. People like this cannot be trusted. They say that they are on this side, and before you know it, they're already on the other side. You never really know what side they belong to. I recall during the Civil War, there was a soldier who wanted to be neutral, and so the upper uh, uniform that he wore belonged to the other army and the pants that he wore belonged to the opposing army. Well, guess what happened to him? He was shot by both sides. And friends, unfortunately, the Pharisees were just like that. They were wearing one set of uniform on top and another set of uniform, you know, at the bottom. And herein, we see their true colors. And if only people were perceptive, they would have seen the hypocrisy of such people. Not only that, it seems that they are believers of the end justifies the means. So they would simply say, well, what we are doing is simply for the good of this nation. Because this Jesus is a fake. This, this Jesus is misleading a lot of people. So 
whatever it takes, they would say. Let's just get rid of Jesus. And again, what do we see here? We see immorality. We see that their ethics, their values, their convictions are up for sale, depending on the situation. And there are many, many people, unfortunately, who are like that. Now, Jesus, however, turns the table around and he tells them, show me the coin uh, which you use for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius and he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? Or whose likeness and inscription do you see? And they said to him, Caesar's. Then he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God." Jesus wanted a Roman coin to be brought to him. And there was really wisdom in doing this. Why would we say so? Well, the point was to show to the Jews that it was the Roman government that was in charge of the affairs of Palestine. And this as a result of the sins of the Jewish people, which they very well knew so that they had no choice but to pay the taxes to the Romans. In other words, the point of Jesus showing or wanting the, the coin to be shown is to really bring conviction to their hearts, to really say, well, the reason why you're paying taxes is because it's your fault. It's not the fault of God. It's your fault. And that is why you need to pay your taxes because you are under sin, you have not repented, and this is God's chastisement upon you. So again, this was the point. So here, it was, as Jesus pointed this out, it was clear that they had no choice but to pay taxes to the Romans. Their plan to bait Christ backfired on them because they were made aware of their failure. They were, they were made aware of their apostasy. They were made aware of their backsliddenness. Now, since they were deprived the privilege of governing their own land, they should pay taxes to the one governing. Their spiritual affairs still remained within God's domain, and so they should fulfill their responsibilities with God. Jesus was able to escape their trap and turn things around. Again, one of the principles I see here is whatever a man sows, he shall reap. If he sows bad things, then he will reap bad things. If he sows good things, then he will reap good things. Therefore, whatever a man does, there will always be that boomerang effect upon him. Let me share to you a little illustration. A few years ago, a newspaper editorial commended most truck drivers for using their CB radios in a constructive way. However, it concluded with a warning to those who misuse this means of communication. The writer gave this unforgettable example. In Colorado, several people begged a trucker to free the channel so that they could put through an emergency call. But this truck driver refused to cooperate. They wanted to direct a doctor to the scene of a serious accident. An automobile had driven into the rear of a flatbed trailer carrying metal tubing. A piece of pipe had gone through the car's windshield, pinning a woman in the wreckage. The trucker continued to tie up the channel, frustrating all attempts to obtain help. Finally, he came upon the scene of the accident himself. And to his utter dismay, he came upon the scene knowing that the one who needed help the one who was injured was his own wife. When a doctor arrived, he said that if he had been notified even 10 minutes earlier, the woman's chances for survival would have been much, much better. 
And so here again, we see that whatever a man sows, he shall also reap. If he sows bad things, he will reap bad things. So the trucker's mischief did indeed return upon his own head, as the Bible says. Now, going back to our narrative, by pointing to the Roman coin, Jesus meant to point to the sins of the Jews. And here, Jesus was really trying to bring them to the point of repentance, which he had been doing time and time again. But the Pharisees were ever callous, so that it did not have any effect on them whatsoever. They were a hopeless case, and they were soon going to enter into God's judgment. Although the context of the church and the government are largely different from the context of the Jews of that time, I'd like to make a little application. We, the church, should give to the government what is due to it since it is commanded in the Scriptures. So Romans 13.5 reads, Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And so friends, as believers in Christ, even though we are not Jews, we find a very specific command on the part of scriptures, commanding us to give honor to whom honor is due. And that includes being able to pay taxes to our government. And you might be wondering, why should we do that? Because we belong to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. It's an entirely different kingdom. It's a, it's a spiritual kingdom, and the spiritual kingdom is much higher than this earthly kingdom. But then again, we have to understand we are still citizens of earth, and we have human responsibilities. And those human responsibilities include submitting ourselves to governing authorities. Likewise, it largely benefits us as citizens when you and I pay taxes because what happens is government could best serve us. Why? Because they could use the money to build bridges, build more roads, for example, or build houses for the poor. They could do a lot of things when we are able to pay our taxes. And so in the end, we are the ones who get the benefit from paying our taxes. And, and think about this. One of the things that happened during the time of the Lord Jesus Christ is that through their taxes, there was a road network that the Roman Empire was able to do. And you know what, what, was, what was the good thing about that? The good thing about that, dear friends, is that the gospel spread all over the Roman Empire because of this network of roads. That is what it is able to do. And we also understand that, that government is able to provide the administration of justice, again through courts of law, which again would be paid for by the government itself. And then when we get invaded by a foreign army, we could likewise be protected with the army that gets paid for by the taxes that we pay. So again, dear friends, we have to understand that we have to give honor to whom honor is due. And the Lord Jesus Christ, most especially in the case of the Jews, Jesus was telling them, you have an obligation. And this obligation has come about because of your sinfulness, because of your apostasy and idolatry. And therefore, you are now obligated to pay the government that has dominion over you. This was the will of God for them at that time. Now let's move on and let's talk about the back out. It says in the next verse, And hearing this, they were amazed 
and leaving him, they went away. You know, they marveled at the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were no match to the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is infinite. It is perfect. It is all-knowing. So it's like a fight between a uh, mosquito weight boxer against a heavyweight boxer. I mean, there is no chance of winning on the part of the Pharisees. And they were amazed, the Bible says, meaning to say that they were, they, they, they were left with, with blank minds. They no longer had any argument against the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because it was a no contest thing. They were no match to the perfect wisdom of God and they were greatly, greatly humbled by what had happened in this particular case. And that is why they should have re-evaluated their own stand and conviction regarding Jesus Christ. They should have given Jesus a second look and they should have said, this man has infinite wisdom. This man is speaking the truth. And if only their hearts were right with that display of Jesus' wisdom, right then and there, they should have repented and they should have accepted Jesus as their Messiah. Now, I'd like you to know that these passages show the brightness of Jesus' glory and the darkness of the Pharisees' hearts. In the desire of these Pharisees to make Jesus look bad, they were the ones who were revealed to be and exposed to be the villains who were dressed in religious garb. Their holy attire was deception. They were like angels of light, but in truth, they were cohorts of Satan himself. Those who pretend to be of the truth, but are a lie, to themselves will eventually be exposed. And this is what you and I discover at this time. I'd like to share to you a little story. The expression, face the music, is actually something that originated from Japan. And the story goes that there was this man who had great influence and he wanted to play with uh, the royal band. But the problem was he did not know how to play any instrument. And so what he did upon, the, upon his own request to the uh, one who manages the orchestra, upon his request, he said, let me just uh, sh try to show that I'm playing a flute, but I'm not going to bring out any tone out of it. And so, because the one who was in charge of the orchestra happened to be his friend, he was able to do this for quite a number of years. And he was not discovered until the orchestra leader was replaced. And then he was forced to really play music. And obviously, he was discovered to be a fake. That's the origin of the word face the music. And friends, those who are fake, they will need to face the music one of these days. Now, in ending, i just like to say this. While we may condemn the Pharisees for their refusal to repent, while we might condemn them for their flattery and their, uh, their lying and their deception, their desire to frame up an innocent person, Friends, let us look inward. Could it be that there is a hypocrite deep down inside of us? And while we might point an accusing finger against the Pharisees, let's remind ourselves there are three fingers pointing back to us. And so let it be that this occasion be a time for us to repent and seek the face of our Lord. Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you for this blessed time. Lord, we pray that the word will not return to you null and void, but that it might accomplish the very purpose by which you have sent it for. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. And so friends, again, don't forget, uh, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Facebook page, click the notification bell, and also do not forget, we're on Nationwide Radio and Nationwide TV. We'll see you next Sunday. Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph, and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Good news, brothers and sisters. A radio program will now be heard nationwide through FEBC radio stations. As an added bonus, all Living Word original songs will likewise be aired as well. So, if you would like to listen to our radio program, we're coming out in the following stations. 702 DZAS AM Broadcasting from Pasig every Sunday, 11 a.m. to 11.30 in the morning. We're also coming out from 104.3 DWAY FM from Legaspi. This is also every Sunday from 10 to 10.30 in the morning. And for those of you in Tacloban, we're coming out from 97.5 DYFE FM every Monday from 11.30 in the morning to 12 p.m. For those of you in Sambuanga, we are coming out from our station in 1116 DXAS AM every Sunday from 11.30 to 12 p.m. Also, for those of you in Davao, we're coming out from 1197 DXFE AM every Sunday from 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 2.30 p.m. For those of you in Coronadal, we're also coming out from station 1062 DXKI AM every Saturday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And for those of you in Cagayan de Oro, we're coming out from 103.3 DXJL FM every Sunday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And for those of you from Metro Cebu, we're coming out from 98.7 DYFR FM every Saturday and Sunday from 8 to 9 p.m. Please tell your friends about this and tune in to our radio program. Let us pray that God might use this radio program to become a blessing to as many people as possible. God bless you all. Great news, everyone. We already have three weekend services every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sebuana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. We'd also like to thank our partners, our members who have been consistently giving to partner with us in the work of the Lord. We'd like to share our giving channels to those who would like to partner with us in the work of the Lord. You can deposit your love offerings to the following banks. Banco de Oro. Account name is LWCCCII. The account number is 001-0000068-00. We also have a BPI account. Account name is Living Word Christian Ministries, Cebu Incorporated. Account number is 10210234 
Finally, we have RCBC. Account name is LWCCCII. Account number is 1452005286. To give via GCash, just follow these simple steps. From your GCash app, click Bank Transfer. In Bank Transfer, click the BDO icon under Select Partner Banks. Enter the amount, enter the name LWCCCII, and account number 0010006080, and send the receipt to office at livingword.ph. Then click Send Money. You may also send your love offerings and donations online through our website. Go to www.livingword.ph and click Give and then a dialog box comes out of it. Kindly click on your giving preferences. Thank you and God bless.